everybody. Thanks for uh, letting me be here. It's a, it's a pleasure. So I'm going to talk a little bit about housing and uh, uh, potentially market design for, for public housing. We'll see how I do in that transition. Um, so I wanted to start uh, by just talking through three facts about what we know about neighborhoods, housing, and kids uh, in the, the United States. And the first kind of fact I want to start with is uh, that the U.S. is highly segregated. There's a whole bunch of different ways to see this in data. My favorite way of visualizing this is uh, these so-called racial dot maps. Each dot on this map is showing uh, kind of a representation of a, a hypothetical person corresponding to different racial backgrounds. Light blue is white individuals, uh, orange is black individuals, red is Hispanic individuals, dark blue is uh, Asian individuals, and this is showing you for the New York City area. And what you can do is you can see kind of neighborhoods popping out of different races and ethnicities living in different neighborhoods in a, in a fairly segregated way. Now, uh, this is sort of one measure of, of looking at segregation. You can do this with income segregation. You can do this with education segregation. It gives you different measures, uh, uh, but, but really similar stories of concentration of people uh, living next to each other. One of my favorite ways of looking at uh, differences in outcomes is actually to kind of think about this in a little bit of a longer run kind of perspective and look at in, uh, the outcomes of kids that grow up in these different neighborhoods. So this is sticking in the New York area. Uh, but using data from the Opportunity Atlas to look at the average incomes of kids who grew up in low-income families, so kids whose parents were earning about $27,000 a year, and asking what are their incomes in adulthood. And again, you see a kind of wide geographic variation across neighborhoods at very short levels. So you see in uh, Brooklyn, kids grew up to earn about $21,000 a year. Contrast that with across the river in New Jersey. Sorry for those New Yorkers in the room, uh, but they earn about $44,000 a year, twice as much. Uh, and you see a wide variation even at, at fairly short distances for kids growing up in these different uh, different neighborhoods across, uh, across New York. Now you see that not just in New York. This is showing you a similar picture for kids growing up in Seattle. It'll become apparent for what I'm going to talk about uh, in uh, about 10 minutes, why I'm focused on Seattle here. Um, but there's also high degrees of variation and concentration of uh, low rates of upward mobility for kids growing up, say, in South Seattle and downtown parts of Seattle. So the people who grew up in uh, the downtown Central District area, on average, earn about $25,000, $24,000 a year. If you go into kind of the Queen Anne neighborhood or Normandy Park neighborhoods, earning the mid-40s. If you go out into the suburbs of uh, Kirkland, Bellevue, Redmond, uh, you're in the $40,000 to $50,000 a, a year. Okay, so that's sort of the first fact is that there's a lot of segregation, both in terms of the parental characteristics of people uh, living in places or just individual characteristics of people living in different places and in the variation in the outcomes of your children that are being raised in those neighborhoods. All right, so the second fact I wanna to turn to is that these uh, neighborhoods have a causal effect on these children's outcomes. That's sort of why I was uh, showing you a lot of these differences for, for kids' outcomes. You might think that, you know, on the one hand, geographic variation and where people live and concentration may not be so much of a concern to a market designer. Uh, you might just think that people have different preferences for different types of neighborhoods and they're just sorting perhaps efficiently. Uh, I'm going to start to peel that uh, onion away and argue that's not at all what's going on. And the first step I want to take on that is to argue that a lot of the geographic variation that we're seeing in these different rates of upward mobility, the people who are raised in different neighborhoods reflect the effects of, of growing up in those areas. Okay, so what's the potential uh, uh, other story that you might have in mind. So this variation in, in kind of upward mobility could be driven by a selection pattern of just different latent types of kids that are choosing to live in different neighborhoods and they would have had low rates of upward mobility regardless perhaps uh, of where they lived. On the other hand, you might imagine that a kid randomly assigned to a neighborhood that has lower rates of upward mobility might have lower uh, uh, rates of upward mobility themselves. So in our work, we've looked at the experiences of kids who moved across different areas during their childhood. Uh, so we looked at 7 million children who move across these areas and studied how the patterns of their outcomes varies with the age at the time in which they move to try to document what fraction of that variation looks like it's actually reflecting the causal effect of the place. And I won't have time to go through the entirety of, of that work, but I'll summarize the uh, kind of main finding that we have. If you envision a kid that was growing up in Harlem, let's say, and they uh, considered a move to Hoboken, New Jersey, if they did that uh, uh, at age two, you could imagine 
imagine if they grew up in Harlem, they, uh, people who grew up in Harlem earn about $21,000 a year. People that grew up in Hoboken earn about $44,000 a year. If they do this at age two, we estimate that they pick up about two thirds of that difference. So they'd on average have incomes of about $33,000, $34,000 a year when they grow up. And if you move at later ages, you pick up less and less and less of that difference up to about age 23, after which you pick up very little of that difference. Okay. So what is this kind of suggesting? It suggests that we are all a weighted average of the neighborhoods in which we grew up and where the weights are proportional to the exposure time we had in those areas. All right. And so if you're asking, like, how do we know that's a, a causal effect? So in the paper, we try to sort out this idea that perhaps there's dynamic sorting that would be confounding this pattern in proportion to exposure time. The simplest way, there's a battery of tests in the paper, but the simplest way you can think about this is you can drop family fixed effects into this design and find zero attenuation in this slope, where you then identify it basically off of the age gap in siblings. So if you have a family with two kids, uh, say a four and a five-year-old, and then another family with a three and a six-year-old, uh, both making these moves, you would see that the difference in the outcomes between the three and the six-year-old are three times as large as the difference in the outcomes of the four and the five-year-old, and the magnitudes are proportional to the difference between, say, in this case, Harlem and Hoboken. Okay? And so that's suggesting that these patterns are actually reflecting the causal effects of childhood exposure to these different areas. Okay. So um, this general idea that neighborhoods and kind of where people live determines outcomes later in life has now been documented and replicated in a wide range of different settings. So we've uh, personally uh, been part of replicating this using the moving to opportunity experiment, uh, where it's a randomized control trial of giving families access to housing vouchers to move to better neighborhoods. And I'll talk about that, uh, uh, some follow on work from that in a second, but you basically find similar exposure type patterns where the earlier you move to a, a neighborhood with higher upper mobility, the higher your incomes are later on. Eric Chin has some work studying public housing demolitions. So in Chicago, uh, they demolished uh, in sequence a whole bunch of public housing projects over time. And what he documents is that if you were, uh, that the younger you were at the time your public housing unit was demolished, the higher your incomes are later on in adulthood, with the idea being that when the public high, uh, these high poverty public housing projects were demolished, you were then exposed to lower poverty, uh, perhaps higher quality neighborhoods for your, uh, for your upbringing. These patterns are documented in, in uh, uh, several other countries. So I'm showing you similar patterns for Australia, Brazil, Canada, and Africa. We're not unique in having these kind of childhood exposure effects and this idea that you are sort of a product of, of where, you've, uh, where you've grown up. Okay, so uh, it matters where you, you grow up. And so now I wanna kind of turn to the kind of question at hand. Uh, how does that interact with the policies we have for helping families live in different places or choose where to live. Okay. The third fact I want to document in this setting is that the existing public housing programs that we have, even the housing choice voucher programs, do very little to remove these patterns of segregation. Okay. So just to set the stage and kind of step back, um, there's two major forms of public assistance for housing in the United States. You have uh, public housing, which you can think of as hard units. So these are administered by uh, local housing authorities. So there's 3,300 uh, local housing authorities across the United States. Each one of them basically was kind of created to manage and buy local buildings and create, lo build local buildings uh, that they then uh, rent out to individuals that are eligible. Uh, now, this has been historically criticized for creating pockets of concentrated poverty. Uh, so a lot of these kinds of uh, public housing units were created kind of very large units, especially in the uh, uh, in the 50s, 60s and, and early parts of the, the 70s. Um, interesting kind of side bit, you know, the federal government ended up funding kind of the construction of a lot of these things and then relied on more local funding for the maintenance. At least that's the anecdote. You can imagine how that uh, unfolds in a, a kind of a local political economy uh, story. For those of you that are interested in understanding kind of the history of public housing, by far the best book to read, and even just the first chapter or two, uh, is Massey and Denton's American Apartheid. It's one of the better books, I think, that's been written on this, this area. So partially in response to this kind of increased se uh, segregation that was being driven by public housing uh, projects, uh, in 1974, the US created this housing choice voucher program. And this is I, the idea behind this program was to give families choice very much, you know, they, you can see the analogy to the school choice uh, uh, setting here and expand the opportunities for where parents could choose to raise, uh, raise their kids or just more generally if you were homeless, so you could have the opportunity to lease up in a, 
uh, in a place that uh, uh, was a private unit as opposed to relying on, on public housing. Both of these programs are administered by local public housing authorities. In a sense, the fact that the vouchers are being administered by local public housing authorities is kind of an artifact of the public housing authorities originally being created to manage public housing, where it's important to be geographically close to, uh, to where those units are being created. Um, we're kind of left with the jurisdictional boundaries uh, on the Housing Choice Voucher Program as a result of those uh, historical patterns. Housing in the US is not an entitlement. Right, so uh, applications for public housing and housing choice voucher uh, programs are dramatically over uh, uh, oversubscribed. So people uh, uh, are allocated via wait lists, uh, sometimes via lotteries. There's been some work exploiting those uh, lotteries, uh, both in the U.S. and, uh, and abroad, uh, that uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll hear more about. Okay, so I'm going to focus a little bit more for the, what remains on the housing choice voucher program, both because uh, kind of in the general discourse, there's been a bit of a decline away from pushing public housing more towards uh, housing choice voucher. And I know that also relates a little bit more closely to school choice and perhaps uh, uh, is of interest to, to folks in this room. So I'll tell you a little bit more about the housing, housing choice voucher program. There's just over 2 million families in the program in any given year. Uh, the way you are eligible for this program is that you have your income that is below some kind of threshold that is determined uh, based on each jurisdiction. It's usually about 30% uh, of the area median income. If you qualify for that, you can put your name on a wait list. Uh, typically, these wait lists are about two years. Uh, it depends on kind of how many kids you have, you're homeless, if you've been victims of uh, a victim of domestic violence, that can affect where you are on the wait list. And each public housing authority uh, handles these wait lists in a, uh, in a different, uh, slightly different way. Once you get off the wait list, if you get off the wait list, you then kind of come in for an intake with the public housing authority. They walk you through the uh, uh, kind of the eligibility, they verify eligibility, and then they give you uh, a voucher if you are still eligible for the voucher. Once you get the voucher, you then can go, have to go find a unit, a landlord that is willing to rent to you, a spot that they will be willing to rent to you. And you usually have about four months to, to do that. I'll, I'll return to this kind of at the, the end. Then once you uh, agree with a landlord, the landlord's going to say, okay, you can live here and uh, uh, I will accept your, your voucher. The voucher subsidizes your rent. The tenant pays generally about 30% of their income, and the voucher pays for the rest. Okay. So then you might say, what caps the total size of the voucher payment? Um, so in general, it's got to be uh, what the landlord was charging for the unit, but there is a cap uh, in each uh, area based on uh, either a fair market rent that is blanket across a metropolitan area, or in some areas like Seattle, uh, they have uh, uh, rent, uh, fair market rents that vary based on the location of the unit. So if you're trying to lease up in a more expensive place, you can generally use a larger, uh, uh, the voucher will generally pay more, but your 30% wouldn't generally change, okay? All right. Uh, then lastly, there's an inspection process that the landlords hate um, that uh, does some things that are reasonable, like look for lead paint if you have children, other things that uh, uh, one could debate, but that's another process uh, that occurs with this uh, uh, that's different from if you were just getting a, a private relationship with a landlord. Okay, so I mentioned that this kind of policy is, uh, and housing policies more generally are, are not doing uh, uh, all that much to reduce residential segregation in the U.S., um, I'll try to make that more concrete and be explicit about what I mean by that. So what I want you to envision is a data set of every individual in the United States and attach to them the poverty rate of the census tract in which they reside, and then plot the histogram of that. That is what you are looking at on this slide. And then we can do that for public housing recipients. Um, and you can see that in, on average, public housing recipients live in higher poverty census tracts. Part of that is mechanical and that the public housing unit itself is comprising a large fraction of the census tract. And we can look at voucher recipients, uh, and you can see that on average, the poverty rates are about twice as high relative to the average population. It is much lower than public housing, uh, almost mechanically by the construction of the, the program. Um, but the key question uh, that a lot of uh, my work and other, work, uh, other folks have been focused on is sort of why uh, don't voucher recipients pick census tracts that uh, are, are perhaps more, uh, more representative or in general have higher rates of, uh, of upper mobility for their kids, um, better amenities, things of those, those natures. Okay, so that's showing you patterns overall. I'll zoom in on Seattle, and I just want to show you the top 25 locations of where voucher holders reside in the Seattle area. So this is just kind of making that histogram a little bit more concrete. 
Each green dot corresponds to a tract in which uh, is one of the 25 most common voucher holder uh, uh, locations. And if you kind of squint at this, you can see that they tend to be concentrated in areas that uh, say have lower rates of upward mobility uh, for, their, uh, for their kids. There's very few uh, vouchers, for example, being used in Bellevue, Richmond, uh, Redmond, Kirkland, those kind of uh, suburbs, but also some of the bedroom communities here, the Normandy Park community on the south side, um, not many vouchers used in those areas. So that sort of raises the kind of research question that this literature has been grappling with, which is sort of why. Uh, why don't families sort of move to areas that seem to have higher rates of, of upward mobility for their kids? You can broadly think of kind of two classes of exclamations. Uh, you know, first, just note that we've kind of ruled out the price story in and of itself in that the voucher has higher value if you were to move to, to Bellevue. Uh, for example. And so we're kind of left with preferences type stories on the one hand, where families might prefer to stay in, in current neighborhoods, they might have connections to family, have shorter commutes, uh, all kinds of different stories one can tell. On the other hand, you might think that there's barriers, perhaps in the search process, lack of information, landlord discrimination that is driving these, these different patterns. So I'll walk you through uh, kind of what we think uh, is driving these patterns. So we did a randomized control trial in Seattle to try to distinguish between these two stories. And what we did uh, is we started with these kind of maps of upward mobility in Seattle and defined a set of neighborhoods that we called opportunity neighborhoods. And we uh, uh, used just neighborhoods that had high rates of upward mobility, classified them as uh, 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 high upward mobility areas. Basically, it's a top third of uh, census tracts in the Seattle King County area. We then paired each family, um, each, uh, uh, so somebody comes into the housing authority, they have a child, uh, we then paired them in a randomized fashion. So if you were part of the treatment group, you got access to the following services. Uh, first was customized search assistance. So we paired them with a rental broker, which you can think of as like a realtor, except they also help you with like looking through your credit history, thinking about how you would navigate questions that a landlord would ask you about your past rental history, a past eviction and things of that nature. So it's a little bit more uh, kind of one-on-one -on -one than a uh, than a realtor's uh, uh, standard job. On average, these people spent about six hours with these these families. We also, uh, the, the rental brokers did some direct engagement with landlords to try to say, hey, would you be willing to lease your, uh, lease your apartment to somebody uh, in the public housing program that has a kid? 47% of the rentals that I'm going to show you in a second came through that type of referral process. And then finally, we gave them some short-term financial assistance. We put a little grease in the wheel, so to speak, where if the family had a, uh, some type of small payment that needed to be made in order to uh, lease up a, a, a unit and be able to rent, they would uh, be able to use it. On average, this corresponded to about $1,000. Okay, so this program cost us about $2,600 per family in Seattle. That's a lot of money. Uh, if you just ask the housing authorities, like per person that gets a voucher, that's a pretty decent chunk of change. On the flip side of that, for somebody who gets a housing voucher, those housing vouchers have a present discounted value of about $100,000. Uh, so on that perspective, it's not all that much of uh, much money. It's paying a good fraction of rent. It's paying it for a number of years. Uh, and so is it big? Is it small? Uh, it is what it is. Okay. One thing I'll just tell you, we're, uh, in this treatment, we didn't require families to move to higher opportunity areas. They can use their voucher anywhere in Seattle. The thing that they got was this access to this rental broker and these services to help them uh, move to these kind of designated opportunity areas. And so what we saw is that in the control group, uh, basically 15% of families moved to uh, opportunity areas, very similar to the historical uh, average of families with kids. And then in the treatment group, more than half of them moved to opportunity areas. Uh, they've scattered throughout Seattle. So each green dot on here is showing you a location of a family that uh, moved in the, in the treatment group. The red is the control group. And the point that we just want to make here is that families tended to not concentrate in any particular area. They all had fairly unique places where they ended up uh, uh, residing throughout these opportunity areas. All right. Okay. Um, you also could have imagined, you know, we paired them with a rental broker. Um, maybe that person was just a really good salesperson and kind of convinced them to move to a place uh, that uh, they might not have really liked. Um, so we interviewed them six months later, uh, did some qualitative interviews that I'll, I'll talk more about in a second, but just asked them, like, are you satisfied with your neighborhood? Are you going to stay there? And it's actually, you would have expected if they were steered to those neighborhoods, they'd be like, no, I mean, I'm going to probably move back. Uh, but then if anything, you see the opposite. They're more happy with the neighborhoods that they live in, and they're more likely to, uh, to say that they're going to stay. 
in the three years since we've done the experiment, they have stayed. Uh, so this is showing you the persistence in those uh, in those neighborhoods. So they are not sort of moving away in, in kind of mass mass exodus. It looks like they're staying there and raising their kids in those new neighborhoods. Okay. Um, so this suggests that there was some pretty significant barriers that these families face when choosing a pretty major decision of where to raise your child when you're just given a housing voucher that's effectively giving you $100,000 to in kind uh, to decide where to uh, uh, where to raise their kid. And so we've, uh, we've got some evidence in sort of what might be driving these different patterns. So we did some uh, quantitative, uh, a quantitative approach of trying to break down an experiment uh, and break down the experimental components to try to understand what's going on. And then some qualitative interviews with the participants in the study that I'll talk through. So on the uh, quantitative side of things, we just broke apart the experiment into different pieces, uh, gave them financial. Uh, so the first piece is just giving people financial uh, support and information. You might have imagined if you just pay people to move to better neighborhoods that they would do it. Um, and if you told them where those neighborhoods were, uh, you might see them uh, do that. It doesn't actually work. Uh, turns out you have to really pair them with these rental brokers. So then if, you know, to kind of buttress that theory, if you increase the caseloads of these rental brokers and make their lives more difficult, uh, make it tougher for those rental brokers to do more things for those families, you see lower rates of moving to opportunity areas. That's that 26% there. It's really only when you give them uh, kind of the ability to meet all of the individual specific needs of the uh, people that are searching for housing that you see these rates. So we actually replicated in the second phase of our experiment, our first uh, uh, experimental treatment effect of just over 50% moving to opportunity areas. Okay. And then I want to, want to give uh, kind of a brief discussion of some qualitative evidence uh, that we have as well. So we, uh, Stephanie DeLuca at Johns Hopkins led uh, basically a series of interviews with these families uh, to, uh, to figure out like what was going on in the minds of, of these families. And really two things kind of came out of uh, those lessons. The first is really kind of a scarcity idea when making these types of choices. Uh, most of these families have really extremely limited time and resources to be deciding where to live and that the uh, rental broker was really helping break down a lot of those barriers. Uh, the second is a customization story where the caseworkers were really able to solve the unique barriers that each family has when thinking about moving to different areas. And so I'll walk just through some quick uh, quotes here. So Jackie wrote that uh, about her, uh, her uh, rental broker that it was this whole flood of relief. This whole flood of I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't know how I'm going to uh, what I'm going to do. This isn't working. And yeah, I think it was just the supportive nature of having lots of conversations with Megan, who was her rental broker. Uh, there was a broken brokering with landlords component that that Leah noted, which is the uh, she said that you know when you find a place, the rental broker said I'll come with you and we'll help you fill out the application. I'll talk with the landlord so that Leah didn't have to, uh, and I'll help you do a lot of stuff that maybe sometimes will be complicated. And so she thought the whole application process was was quite uh, quite difficult. On the short-term financial assistance, uh, Jennifer wrote that uh, I'm not going to be able to pay here and, and then there in this new apartment. They were able to get me more money uh, so that they would pay for my first portion of my rent because they understood the situation I was in. So basically, the uh, rental broker figured out that if they could drop the first month's rent, uh, that this, this deal was going to go through. They made the deal, and this person then was able to lease up in these, these areas. Then we unpacked this in the second phase of the experiment and talked to people that only got a fraction of these services. So for people in the just, that just got the ability to have some of the financial support and information, um, Sarah was pretty representative of a response to a question we asked, which is, what do you feel like was missing or might have been helpful in your housing search? And the first thing she said is guidance, support, and help with the process. Uh, they just throw you out there, give you a bunch of information to begin with, and see if you can swim uh, within the time frame you're given. In the reduced services group, Joaquin said, we've dumped 300 to $500 just in application fees so far, not to mention time and gas and everything to do the look. Landlords just don't seem to want to budge. And so Joaquin, at the time we wrote the paper, had yet to find a unit in, a, uh, in a, uh, either a high opportunity place or a unit at all. And then finally, in the control group, uh, Christina uh, wrote, so she got no services right from this experiment. Uh, she says, you know, nobody really helps you find an apartment. I, I found this place, which was a shelter that she was currently living in, uh, on my own. I have sent emails back and forth begging to get in here. My application was sitting downstairs approved for like two days while I'm still in cars and outside with my daughter trying to figure it out. I feel like maybe if the PHAs, the housing authorities, could be more personal with their clients that they're accepting and taking on, that I feel like that, uh, uh, that I feel like that would help with the homeless situation a lot. And at the time we wrote the paper, she, she and her child were still homeless. And so you get a sense of kind of the constraints that families are under when making these types of decisions. 
And so, you know, what do I think are the key lessons that we know in the housing space for what people are going through when making these types of, of decisions? The barriers in the search process are huge. They drive a good portion of the residential segregation that we see. They have implications for the outcomes of their children later in life. And so it suggests there's potentially high returns to market designs that reduce these search frictions. Right? You can see it uh, in those quotes, at least if uh, I think you can see that they, if you can think about better ways of designing this market, it could have really huge, huge returns. There's a lot of money that's being left on the table. Uh, you know, if you just think of the present discounted value of earnings for a child that moves to an opportunity neighborhood in Seattle versus not, on average, that's about an $80,000 present discounted value of earnings for that, that child. And so I think there's pretty significant returns. Um, but the program we designed, as I mentioned, it's not that cheap. Um, we're doing a lot of different services for those, those families. The housing authorities consider it, I think, reasonably, you know, re a reasonable, difficult question of do we provide more housing vouchers or do we provide these services? Um, you know, to put a quantification on kind of what we think of the benefits are here, for every dollar we spent on the program, it looks like we're getting uh, about $2.6 in kind of returns uh, to that program, which I think you could do a lot better if you were thinking consciously about designing it from a cost-effective way. But the thing I really took away from this work that I think relates to the market to design of public housing is that the search and matching process is the problem. And the question that I have really for all of you is whether market design is the solution. Um, and so I'll put out just a few implications that at least I've thought about uh, for, the, for the implications for market design for public housing. So first off, I think working with housing authorities, I mentioned there are 3,000 3, and 300 public housing authorities across the United States, each of which you could walk into and talk to somebody about whether or not they'd be willing to collaborate with you. There's a lot. Uh, we've done this. We've chatted with our project. This project started by uh, starting to talk with Greg Russ, who was the head of the Cambridge Public Housing Authority at the time. We ended up working with folks over at the Seattle Housing Authority. It's a longer story. I can tell it over lunch. Uh, but getting to know these people, they are interested in supporting their families. They're constrained, and, and a lot of them are very, uh, very eager to do better, uh, to do, uh, to do good things with their uh, their populations. I think improving the matching process of tenants and landlords. Like you just see how difficult it is. I mean, think about how difficult it is for all of us to find housing. Now imagine you've got all of these other constraints in your daily life trying to find housing. I think it's it's quite clear this is having a really big impact on, uh, on children and on residential segregation. Some landlords don't like renting to Section 8 or Housing Choice Voucher holders. So this is a third bullet point. Thinking about clever mechanisms, clever designs to bring in more landlords into the system, I think would be quite, quite helpful. So one thing we did in Seattle that proved quite uh, quite useful, at least when you talk to the landlords, is to offer them an insurance policy. So we said, hey, if the uh, person damages the unit, we'll pay up to a couple grand to cover the cost of that. They all thought that was fantastic, especially the people who had never interacted with uh, people in the public housing program. Uh, for all the families we sent through the program over four years, there were two uh, filings. Uh, of those insurance policies. So it's as cheap as it gets for kind of vouching for the voucher holders, so to speak. So fourth, I think mechanisms to improve cooperation across PHAs. This structure was designed for public housing units, but is now being used for vouchers in, in large part, right? It's not designed very well for that. Market designers could help fix that. Can we create better ways for PHAs to work with each other to help do what's called port vouchers across jurisdictions or work with other, uh, uh, other PHAs to tr trade uh, vouchers, people that want to move into your jurisdiction, et cetera. There's a lot of institutional details that kind of goes behind the scenes here, but for those of you that are interested, I'm happy to talk about what I know on those fronts. Fifth, integrating public housing and voucher applications. So right now you often apply to both things separately. I'm guessing Winnie will tell you more on, on those fronts. Um, but I think there's a lot of really interesting things to think about on the waitlist design, giving people more information and certainty. Like you can imagine you apply for something and three years later, boom, you just figure out, geez, I, I got this voucher. It's kind of a shock. And then all of a sudden you only have three, four months to figure out what you're going to do uh, with this newfound uh, luck. And I think that relates lastly to this last point, which uh, I think is by far the most important one, which is thinking about market designs to increase uh, what people call lease up. So I mentioned that when people get those vouchers, they have about four months to use them across the United States. So just actually, let me set the stage here. How much are those vouchers worth? On average, people stick around about seven, eight years. And I said it's about $100,000 in present discounted value in kind. 
what's the average incomes of these people? It's less than $20,000 or so. So this is like a five-fold increase. This is like five times your annual income that you get. All you have to do is find a landlord in a place that you can lease up in in four months, okay? Fully one-third of people in the United States that get these vouchers do not lease up. They are eligible, they have the voucher in hand, they do not lease up, all right? So just think about the, it's rare you can kind of put a number on the size of the market failure here, the size of the search friction, but it's enormous, right? And I think that thinking about general ways of how do we do market design in contexts where choice is hard, search is hard, I think is a really crucial uh, area for, for future work. So, okay, I'll stop there, uh, but thanks.